Lord. Our speaker, remember Sunday I told you there is a speaker coming? Uh, he has, he landed. He's not landing now. He landed. And uh, he has been here since Friday. And I know that um, he has a word for us. All what I would ask you to do is to open up your spirit that the servant of the Lord coming this many miles will bring that word that helps us to close and end the year well. Just a little bit, a little profile of him. Apostle D. Uh, Lamola is the founding senior pastor of one of the fastest growing church, God's throne for all nations. Together with his wife, Prophetess D. Lamola, they are pastoring GTFAN based in Pretoria, South Africa. Apostle Lamola is a family man blessed with three kids, Letato, Devhato, and Motheo. Woo! The last one almost like Motheo uh, from, you know, you know, we that come from Machakos. <laughs> His pen has authored more than 10 books in uh, leadership manuals and church leadership training courses. Apostle D. Lamola hosts an annual pastors and leaders clinic a conference that attracts pastors and church leaders across the nation of South Africa. He's an apostolic voice of leadership, for leadership, church governance, church management, church administration, as well as church finance. Apostle D. Lamola is an academic by profession, a scholar of the world. He possesses special grace of teaching and preaching the word with power and simplicity. He's an apostle of the supernatural manifest presence of God, used by God in strong discernment, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith and healings and miracles. In his ministry, the following has been witnessed, the blind receiving their sight, crippled walking, hemia uh, closed, stroke healed, uh, among many others. Many were delivered from various forms of demonic oppression, possession, and torment. Apostle D. Lamola planted several churches across the three provinces of uh, South Africa, Gwateng, Mpumalanga, and Northwest Province. Through his apostolic and prophetic network, life and light network of churches, the apostle provides spiritual covering and mentorship to many sons and daughters in the faith. With more than six independent churches, or ministries submitting under his leadership. Apostle D. Lamola, his name is popular in conference circles both in South, and B South Africa and beyond. He's featured in most conferences in South Africa. His marriage ministry, Daniel Lamola Ministries, hosts an annual marriage conference in Swaziland, Mazzini. Apostle D. Lamola is flexible and well informed to address different topics in Christianity from family to church, from leadership to finance. Now I want you to forget all that. All that are cleared, please, just put it aside. I want you to receive the servant of the Lord. Remember what the Bible says, you receive a prophet. As a prophet, what do you get? You get a prophet reward. You receive a teacher, as a teacher, what do you get? Uh, the reward of a teacher. Is there one? Eh? So the thing is, I want us to rise up. Let's receive the servant of the Lord. Let the servant of the Lord, the graces that God has placed in his heart, be part of us today. And that the spirit of the Lord will use him more than he has ever felt. This is his first time to come to this country. Let this country receive the servant of the Lord. Apostle Daniel Lamola. Let's receive him. Even you people at home, please let's receive him in the name of the Lord. Let's receive him. Amen. Hallelujah. Shall we thank the Lord for a minute? Father, we give you praise, glory. Honor and adorations is yours. 
thank you for this opportunity in this moment to represent your kingdom. May you release your manifest glory, presence, so that everyone may be ministered to in their soul, their spirit, and body. That no need shall go and minister to in Jesus' name. Amen. We may be seated in his presence. Allow me to greet you this morning in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Take this time to honor the great leadership of one of the senior leaders of this nation that uh, in South Africa they hold you at a great regard. Uh, the Honorable Bishop Jimmy Kimani and the wife, we, we celebrate and we thank God for a privilege in our lifetime to be part of greatness and what God is building and doing in the wonderful nation of Kenya. May we appreciate the Honorable Bishop and the wife. <clears throat> Come on, we can do better. Let's appreciate the Bishop. Let's appreciate, let's appreciate, let's appreciate, let's appreciate. Come on, go ahead and celebrate the grace. Go ahead and celebrate what God has blessed the nation of Kenya with. In Jesus' name, amen. We really honor you, celebrate you, and thank God for what he's doing through you. And all the wonderful pastors and leaders of this great movement of Deliverance Church receive our greetings. Thank you for having us here. We appreciate and thank you for being of great assistance to the servant of God in fulfilling what the Lord has called him to do in his lifetime. Let's appreciate our leaders. Amen. Receive a special word of greeting from my wife, who is now ministering um, same time in South Africa. Um, our first services just started, and they are already on, on the podium. She said, I must really send you sincere greetings and her love. And I hope you receive her in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, happy birthday, protocol man. Thank you for sacrificing on your birthday to be with us here in Kenya. Can we appreciate him once more? Amen. Oh, let's appreciate him once more. Let's appreciate him once more. Hallelujah. I've got a word for you. And um, within the next few minutes, I'll be concluding what I'm starting I want to deal with a subject that I believe God, I'll break it into three sessions as we go in the day. But I want to deal with the foundations of restoration. The foundations of restoration. Some of the tallest buildings that you know in Kenya, including this wonderful cathedral, where we minister in the word from, it's not as tall as it is because of the strength of the pillars supporting it to the roof, but it is as it is because of the foundation that was thoroughly prepared. You compromise the foundation, you can't fix it on the wall, you can't fix it on the roof. If the foundation is compromised, the results, the roofing, will be compromised. In Isaiah, the 26th, 28th chapter, I'm not there, I'm just giving you something, verse number 16. Isaiah, 1,500 years before the coming of the Christ, he see prophetically and he tells us that Jesus is the sure foundation. If you build upon him, you will not go wrong. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 3 of the first Corinthians, verse 10 to 12, he reaffirms that Christ is the foundation. And whoever built need to be careful how they build on this foundation. According to Paul, in that context, we are all builders. Some of us build with gold, some with silver, some with precious stones, 
and some will build with wood that will not be able to stand the test of God. Therefore, it is of great importance that we work around the issue of foundation as we deal with the subject of restoration. Because the foundation deals with the strength of whatever you're building. It deals with the durability of whatever you're building. It can be marriage, it can be career, it can be any field, business. If the foundation is compromised, the longevity of whatever you're building is compromised. Nobody, no builder can correct the foundation at any state of the building. In psychology, we learn that the first seven years of human development from the day of birth those are very critical ages because that is where the cognitive of the little one is formed and the interpretation of normal and abnormal, acceptable and the otherwise. It is all formulated and built in that side. So it is therefore of great importance that one need to understand what are we dealing with when we deal with the subject of foundation. Because we can have the high rate of divorce even in the church. Not because couples love grew cold. We can have high rate of divorce because we compromised on the foundation of building of marriages. Churches can be closed. Churches can die. And I'm not prophesying but some churches will not even survive post-COVID-19 season. It is not that God didn't call them but the foundation of what they were building has been compromised. So when you deal with foundation, you look at a subject from the cellular level. You deal with the fundamentals of our faith and our belief. When you deal with foundation, you deal with the subject of knowing and understanding what you know. It is possible that by knowledge or theoretically, you can know how to cook, but practically you don't know or you don't understand what you know from theory. So foundations suggest that we need to know what we believe and understand what we know. So it is not enough only to know, but after knowing one ought to understand. And it is in those words that I want to bring our attention to the book of Acts chapter number 1. To the book of Acts chapter number 1. As you are getting over there, and if you give me verse number 8, that is the correct one. I want you to sit at as you are to look at your neighbor as a neighbor. Foundations are important. Look at a good neighbor as a neighbor. In God, restoration is possible. If they don't believe, you can look at a third neighbor say, neighbor, Peter, in his family, where he had a father and a grandfather, and a great-grandfather, of whom none had ever walked on the water, but Peter became the first one to walk on the water. And I want your neighbor to believe that if Peter became the first one in the family to walk upon the water, by the grace of God, you can become the first one in your own household. I mean, if they don't believe, tell them Joseph was the first one in their family to become the prime minister in a foreign land. And by the grace of God, if that happened, you can be the first one in your own space, career, and area of existence. Or oh, yes, it was Mary in the whole history of humanity that she became the first woman to be pregnant without biological processes. And if God can pick individuals to be the first one in a generation, I believe by the reason of this meeting, there will be a grace that shall flow in this house. That God will pick up somebody to be the first in the nation of Kenya. I don't know about what inventory, I don't know about what technology that God can reveal to you, but I pray this morning that God release a special grace to fall upon somebody under the sound of my voice to become the first. 
the first one. Let's look at verse number eight. But you shall receive power. Dunamos. When the Holy Ghost, the helper, the advocate and the strengthener shall have come upon you. This power is the strength to enable you to do it can be miracles, it can be services, it can be ministry, and this power can give you courage and boldness. This power is intrinsic. It operates from inside, outside. But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost shall have come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end, to the end of the earth. In the progression of the order of the areas where the instruction comes. Look, the doctor who's writing is always retrospective, informs us of a great phenomena that is of great importance for you and me to understand. It says, first and foremost, you need to be my witness in Jerusalem. From Jerusalem to the region of Judea. From the region of Judea, before you go to other parts of the world, you need to deal with Samaria. From Samaria, you can go to the nations of the world. I'm going to be doing a little bit of a teaching and a preaching right there. And I want you to please flow with me for the next 20 something minutes. Maybe it is of important to understand the three key restorative moves of God that happen both in the Old and the New Testament. The first, of course, is when Israel is captured by Moses, I mean, by, by, by Pharaoh in Egypt, and Moses become an instrument of restoration of Israel. In that season, we needed to demonstrate the presence and the power of God. Through signs and wonders, Moses liberated the people. So it is of great importance that the church move into a level and a dimension of demonstration of what God has given to them. The Bible student called the second restorative movement the great divorce of Israel. The great divorce deals with concept after the death of David. Solomon is taking over and the kingdom is divided. When the kingdom of Israel divides, we have the northern kingdom and we have the southern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, we have two nations. is Benjamin and Judah. The two fought to become one. And they have a capital that will later be called Jerusalem that was won by David. On the other kingdom, in the great divorce, you have got the ten tribes or the sons of Jacob that 
have the capital that is going to be called Samaria. Samaria means a place of hybrid worship. Samaria is a compromised godly system. Samaria is people that honor idols. It is the fallen state of Israel. And look the doctor says. When the power of the Holy Ghost come upon you. You shall be my witness. In Benjamin and Judah. Then you shall go. Before you go to Kenya. You shall move into Samaria. Which is the fallen children of Jacob. So in chapter 2 of Acts, the Holy Ghost cannot come until the children of Jacob are restored together. So then, in that season of the great divorce, there are five key people that God will use. To facilitate the process of restoration from the great divorce. There will be Daniel. There will be Zechariah. Daniel will speak directly when they are captured into Babylon. And Zechariah will restore the spirituality. It is in the first time when Zechariah open his mouth post Babylon that you have got ten visions for the first time since Israel was diluted in Babylon. For the first time when Zechariah opened the mouth, God opened up the spirituality of Israel. Two, there need to be Haggai post Babylon. Haggai is going to deal with the negligence of the temple of God in terms of financial contribution. The third witness will be Malachi. The last prophet before the great silence. Malachi is going to come. To address two or three issues. One. He will say. There is no more honor. Two. He will say. You robbed me financially. Three. He will say. Restoration of godly order. Then in the same space. Post Babylon. God will send down Nehemiah. Who is going to raise up a people with the heart of God to build God a house. Then there will be Ezra who restored the integrity and the dignity of the word of God in the land and the living. And there will be Esther that come to demonstrate the favor of God. And what Acts in Luke says in the book of Acts is that there need to be a process of restoration before you can move into the dimension and the level that you've been praying for and that you've been believing God for. And through Dr. Luke, we also learn that the first foundation that needed to be restored, we call it the foundation one, which is unification, oneness, and unity. Unless we become one, we speak in one voice, we breathe the same thing, we talk the same thing as Deliverance Church here in Zimmerman, when you talk to the person in the back they can be able to show and to tell that they've drained from the great vessel that have been speaking and releasing from here until we come to the level of unity in faith, until we come to the level of unity in doctrine, until we come to the level of unity in expression of our faith in the house of God we will not see the great restoration of God because the Bible says before X2 come, they need to be together in the upper room in the upper room they need to be from the tribe of Daniel from, from, from the tribe of Dan from the tribe of Benjamin they don't need to be Jerusalem they don't need to be Samaria we need to be one in the upper room if oneness is restored in the ministries in the church if oneness is restored in the place of worship if oneness is restored in leadership if oneness is restored in all the programs of the church then we can safely arrive in Acts chapter 2. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You see, in the absence of unity, we become vulnerable. 
If you have observed the herd of lions hunting after the vulnerable herd of buffaloes, you will realize that any buffalo that trusts in its own independent strength and it breaks ranks from the head of the buffalo, it is more likely to be feasted upon, it is more likely to become breakfast, it is more likely to become dinner for the lions. But as long as the lions, as long as the buffaloes are united, there is nothing that a big head of 50 lions with 5 male lions and 45 female lions, they cannot take down a calf of a buffalo as long as we all protect one another, as long as we all cover one another, as long as we walk in unity, in oneness and in togetherness. It is in the presence of visions and visions that divisions begins. And wherever there is division, God doesn't move. Wherever there is division, we delay the supernatural. Wherever there is division, miracles delay to arrive. That is why in the Psalms, David says, how wonderful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord has commanded a blessing. So there is a blessing when the church move in one spirit, in one attitude, in one spirit, and in one heart. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Competition is only possible in the absence of unity. If you play together as a team, a goalkeeper cannot compete with a striker. A striker cannot compete with defense. You might be gifted to score the goal, but I'm gifted to create a space and give you a ball. So your scoring are not better than me. We are in the same team. When we win, they say Barcelona won. They don't single out the name of an individual. That's the foundation of unity. The foundation of oneness. We need to avoid competition so that we can bring integration of skills. So that we can bring integration of gifts. So that we can bring integration of resources. So we can bring integration of privileges that God has given to us. When we tap into the mode of division and non-unity, somebody come to sing a song and those that are not in that league, they hold back in supporting to make the lead singer sound like they are not gifted. But when it is a member of their group, they all come and start to dance. They all start to come to make movement. It's a division, it's a, it's a plot of the enemy. It is what slow the growth of the church. Hallelujah. So, if you go back to Psalms, you go back to Isaiah, the coming of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2 has been promised. And there are different role players that need to play a role. One of the key ones should be David. David should conquer and secure Jerusalem and make it the city of God. But that's all what David does. It is only in the generation of Peter that they will possess Jerusalem and the Holy Ghost come. But there will also need to be a Nehemiah who will go to rebuild it. You see, you are not better than me by going to rebuild. You are a liver, I'm a kidney. You are a spleen, I'm a nose. Your work is to smell. But if you smell seated down, you need a leg to walk you there. But the leg can walk you there until the brain interpret the message and tell the leg, stand up and walk because they've been smelling. So you realize that as the body, we need to be integrated. We need to be systematic. We need to be what? Because it doesn't matter how sharp your eyes can be. 
if your brain can interpret the signal and tell you there is a snake, ask the feet. Request service of the feet to run away. You will be seated there. You look at the black mamba. It will be coming closer to you and it will break you. The problem is you behave as if you are all the organs yourself. You behave as if you are the liver, the kidney. That is why God, Paul says, we are the body of Christ. Different ministries, one spirit. We just come to supplement. To you, God gave you the ability to intercede with power. You are not better than this one who is given the ability to lead. You are not better than this one who is given the capacity to support financially. And you are not better. If all of you can come together and be united, suddenly the Holy Ghost will come. So there needs to be a foundation of unity in the upper room. When we get in the upper room, we don't ask for tribe. In the upper room, we don't say, of which tribe do you come from? In the upper room, the focus is Jesus. Even those that went to Samaria, in the upper room, Jesus. The second foundation. In the upper room, the Bible says, they prayed. There won't be restoration from the great divorce if Daniel will not go up three times a day to pray. Remember, in the heartbeat, the DNA of Babylon is Daniel, the main prophet. In restoration, in, in, in the book of 2 Kings, overlapped by 2 Chronicles, that's where Israel is taken. As they arrive in Babylon, there's a 70 years that they need to stay. As they are there for 70 years, God raises a Daniel, and a Daniel rises in the power and authority of prayer. And it is important to understand the foundation of any great move of God that came from the great Astrisa revival it was birthed in prayer. God loves it when the church pray. That is why God is biased to people that pray. I've really looked at in the Bible. God is very biased in a godly way to the people that pray. And I'll show you why God is biased. Whenever you pray, 1 Corinthians 2, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost will go to heaven and will search all things not only all things, but the deep things in the throne room of God. Romans 8, the Bible says, He come to somebody that want to pray and bear witness or to their spirit on what to pray for. In verse 26 to 28, the Bible says, The Holy Ghost, He does the work of intercession. In the same chapter 8, Romans, it says Jesus is doing the work of intercession. In the book of John, the chapter number 15 and 17, the Bible says the Father is doing the work of intercession for the church. So if there is one thing in commonality between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, is that they are all praying for you. The Holy Ghost is making intercession in groanings that words cannot understand. He see an accident come into your mama, and he begin to lay an impression in your spirit to feel to pray for your mama. He, he sees something coming and suddenly you just remember the name of Pastor Dave and you start to rumble in tongues without understanding what you are saying only to realize cancer was coming closer to him and God in the tongues he just gave you a wave to pray to cancel that which was coming. Therefore the foundation of prayer need to be reinforced. No church can experience the perfume of God until the altar of prayer is reinforced. Listen to me very carefully. When a believer prays, the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, teaches us something wonderful. It says, when you pray, 
Your prayer cannot hit the ceiling because your prayer is transported by intelligent services of heaven. The Bible says the, the living, four living creatures and the 24 elders, they receive our prayers. I'm interpreting the morphology of the throne of God so that you understand what happened when you pray and why you must pray. The Bible says the throne, in the throne room, Revelation 5, 8, check that verse there very well. It says the living creatures and the 24 elders, they each have a golden bowels that carry the prayers of the saints. When they get before God, they are not in English, they are not in Swahili, they are not in any earthly language. Listen to me very carefully. When you pray in Shona, you pray in Swahili, you pray in any language in, Ka in Kenya, in heaven, that language is not, it doesn't arrive there. The Bible says they are golden bowels to the four living creatures and the 24 elders that will come to contain your prayer when it arrives at the throne, the Bible says it become a sweet smelling, smelling fragrance. So whenever you pray, you spray God with a perfume and God will always attention himself to the people that pray because when you pray, there is a perfume sprayed in heaven. Number two to check there, when a believer pray, a minimum time, 56 time, your prayer is reported on the throne of, of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you have got four living creatures and 24 elders, each has a bowel, each has a bowel. But the Bible will use plurality. It says bowels. So for the sake of theological accuracy and avoidance of exaggeration, let's just cap plurality to two. But it can be more just for the sake of not swinging the pendulum too far. It will be two. For how many people? Four and 28. What is four and 24? What is 28 by 2? It's 56. So when you pray 56 times, there is a perfume sprayed on the throne of God. And I want you to understand, the people carrying your prayers are not amateurs. One has a face of a lion. That is the king of the jungle. That means there is no witchcraft. That can block through any human animation. That can block a believer's prayer. Because your prayer become like fire. Jeremiah 23, 29. When you release the word, it become fire. And is transported by the lions of God. And you need to understand one of the great manifestations of the angelic in God. In, in the book of Kings he says, they appeared as chariots and horses of fire. So it means it will just take that form, but it will have fire. So your prayer is transported by the elders to the throne. Not only the elders, but the living creatures. And one with the face of a lion, one with the face of man talking about supernatural intelligence. They can calculate and see how to move around it for it to arrive. That is why every prayer arrives at, at heaven. It doesn't matter who prayed. It's just that the answer that come, you might not like it. Sometimes you pray, God says, wait. And you, wait, you, you are believing to receive it immediately. Sometimes you pray, God says, no. And sometimes you pray, God says, take it. So if we're going to move into that level of prayer, there is a need for consistency, for restoration to happen. It is not just a one-time moment in prayer. The Bible says three times Daniel went to pray. Every day. Consistency. Every day. Consistency. Every day. Every day. If we're going to bring it together, every day we need to go for prayer. Every day. Every minute. Every moment. We need to go consistency. 
Not only consistency, but long prayers. What is missing in the body of Christ is what Mark says, Jesus went and prayed through the night. Jesus went and spoke to God through the night. What we need is not just a moment in prayer. But imagine if prayer will spray to God the perfume and you do it all the time. That's why the old woman said when she realized the secret of prayer, I will remain in the temple and I'll pray for the coming of the Son of God all the time. So there is a need for the foundation of prayer to be reinforced. The third foundation is a foundation of sacrifice and selflessness. If we go into to see restoration, we want a people that will stand to sacrifice like Jesus, the King of glory. The people will say, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We need a people that will demonstrate a principle of a chicken and a pig. There was a guest speaker and was asked, what are you going to have? And he said, for me, I prefer to have a bacon. And they said, why do you need a bacon against the eggs? He said, because a chicken doesn't know how to sacrifice. A chicken lays an egg and walk away with its own life. A pig for you to have a bacon, it sacrifices its life and say, here I am for you to eat. I'm available to be in your plate. And whenever you have a bacon, you need to remember there's something that sacrifices a life. <laughs> so when we come to the house of God, we need an attitude of a pig. Not in hygiene, in cleanness, but in terms of sacrifice. You need a people, a leaders, a people in the house of God that will know how to sacrifice. That will know how not to pay the TV services in order for us to fix the sound. You need a people that know how to sacrifice entertainment budget just to complete the house of God, to, for it to look well. You need a people that know how to sacrifice so that they can deny themselves data and air time. And when we ask them, why are you not buying data? Why are you not buying? He said, I heard there is a project of cameras at church. Instead of me buying airtime, I rather sponsor God's work with the money for my airtime, with the money for the daughter. Because those are the people that understand how to sacrifice. Those are the people that stand like Jesus. They go on the cross and say, these people sold me out, but I'm going to die for you anyhow. These people crucified me, but I'm dying for you anyhow. These people done the worst cruelty, but I'm going to do. So we need a people that understand sacrifice. Restoration doesn't come until you have got a people that understand sacrifice. One classic example is Nehemiah. By profession, he was a food taster. Before the king will eat, Nehemiah existed in the palace. His work was to eat food before they can be passed to the king. They will give Nehemiah a drink to drink first. And they'll give him some 30 minutes to an hour to check reactions. If the food had poison, then it needed to kill him. So he was a foreigner in a, in a land of Babylon with a privilege to eat from the table of reality. But when he heard that things are not good in the house of God, he said, I'm not going to sit here to enjoy the luxury of the palace. He used his connection privilege, position in royalty to gather resources for the rebuilding of the wall and the gates in, his, in, in, in Jerusalem. Sacrifice. It's not about you driving a nice car. It's about to say, Lord, you brought me here to eat with the king. How can I influence the king for the benefit of the kingdom? 
it was not just him bragging about his position. I am in royalty. I eat what the king eat. I drink what the king drink. I do what the king must do. I sleep on the bed in royalty. When they told him that the walls are broken and the house is in ruins, the Bible says he cried, he fasted, he prayed because he was a man of sacrifice. He denied his role of testing for food until the king looked at him and said, is everything okay? He said, no, my Lord, the house of God, where I come from. Why are you promoted where you're promoted? Why do you think God gave you the position he gave you? He didn't give you to shine. He blessed you to be a blessing. You have what you have. If you go in the book of Exodus chapter number 36, the Bible says he gave Sam skills to cut stone for the building of the temple. The skills, the talents, the gifts that you have is not based on merit. It's not that you are born in a right family. God decided to give you capacity for the work of the ministry. The fourth foundation that I want to close with. Is the foundation of signs and wonders. One day I was preaching in a place called Hamanskra. It's in the northern side of Pretoria. In that meeting there came one old man who moved from different hospitals who could not be helped by anyone. The doctors told him in the condition where you are, he was involved in a car accident and he was paralyzed. And they told him, go home and wait for the day to die. Medically, there's nothing we can do. That guy came into one of the meetings that we had in the northern side of Pretoria. As we were praying, the Holy Spirit said, begin to minister healing to the people. As I begin to minister healing to the people, the old man jumped from the bed where he was lying and he started to walk up and down in the room. In that night, I didn't call the altar call. When the people saw what had happened to a paralyzed man, that became more than 10,000 sermons. One creative, great, genuine miracle in the presence of God replaces 10,000 sermons to convict the world to come to God. You need to understand, Pharaoh doesn't listen to intelligence. Pharaoh has got magicians. When you put the rod down, it be a snake. He put it down to be a snake. The second and the third miracle, the magicians replicated it. The false will do what we do in genuine. But God kept on saying to Moses, go back. He escalated the wave until a dimension where Pharaoh can no longer compete. And this is the time for the signs and the wonders to be back in the church so that Pharaoh can perform to the seventh miracle. But there is a dimension Called the new beginning number eight. The Pharaoh that moved from miracle one. Doing the same thing. Don't kill the false prophet. Let them do their false. Don't kill the false apostle. Let them do their false. But there is a dimension of the upper room. The dimension of Pentecost. That when we get there. You can compete. But up to a certain level. The Bible says there is a level. When they get to miracle eight. Miracle 9 and Miracle 10. Where God is going to divide the hydrogen molecules to the oxygen molecules. For the first time, the principles of chemistry were confused. That in the water, oxygens were running to the left and hydrogen.
nations were running to the right and a tar road was formed and Pharaoh thought he could follow. There is a restoration of signs and wonder. A sign is a mark to show a person come from. If you drive around, you see a police. They've got a uniform. is a sign. They are from the state. A wonder is what something when it happened, you see a sign of the belonging of a person and you, you'll be left with, wow, this is only God. Signs and wonders are the supernatural manifestation that silence every pharaoh in every space. And I've come to announce and to declare and to decree that if there's been any pharaoh anywhere in your life blocking you, may this day mark the end of the existence of Pharaoh. We pull the highest and the last order miracle. We declare as the servants that come from the Lord that whatever Pharaoh standing before you by the name of the El Shaddai, by the name of the God of heaven, by the name of the God of grace, if there be a Pharaoh who is blocking your health in the name above any other name, the name of Jesus, may you receive your miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I decree, I declare according to the authority and the power of the word of the living God that every Pharaoh, their firstborn, if it happened in Exodus, let it be upon your life. I announce to Pharaoh the days of Egypt are over. The days of Babylon are over. The days of struggle are over. This is the time and the time is now. This is the season. I announce to you the door is open in the name of Jesus. I announce to you you shall move out without struggle in the name of Jesus. May your blood receive restoration. May your finances be restored in the name of Jesus. I announce and I declare you shall shine for your God is the restorer. I say you shall shine. You shall be lifted up. You shall shine. Post COVID-19 the enemy is a liar. After this COVID-19 you will rise again. I say you will shine again. I say you will be on top again. There is a sign coming that you are from God. Your colleagues will know that you are from the deliverance church i say your colleagues will know your business people they will look at you and say what is happening to you i announce here on this altar so let it be in the name of jesus may he heal your blood i pray for a reset button in your health wherever from the soles of your feet i want you to receive that miracle as I prayed, the Lord showed me a person with the eye problem. And he said, this one, I'm going to heal. Before I got even into the plane, he showed me the person. He said, this one, I'm going to heal. My may you be healed to the glory of the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Do it for them to the glory of God. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on, give him a hand of praise.